Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Chef Kareen and I welcome you to week two in CU 132, riding on the hills of an awesome week one. Uh, as your chef instructor, I was really impressed with your on-time submissions in this class. You guys did fantastic. It tells me that you're working hard on that uh, time management, which is a skill that will carry you far in the industry. And Chef Kareen, I can tell by the smile on her face over there uh, how proud she is of the work that was done in week one. Real quick, ladies and gents, uh, before we do that, we have an important announcement. Uh, next week, live session, everybody, has changed. It is Thanksgiving week. And uh, I don't know if anybody's noticed the class page uh, for week three yet, but uh, Chef Kareen and I and all the other instructors here at Escoffier are taking Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. So uh, we are going to have our live session on Monday at uh, 6.45 p.m. So the live session next week will be Monday, November the 25th at 6.45 p.m. Central Standard Time. I will also send out another uh, message as a reminder to everybody so nobody misses out on the live session for next week. Uh, so it's very, very important. So don't forget next week, uh, live session week three, Monday, November the 25th, 6.45 p.m. Central Standard Time. If you try to get a hold of us on uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it might be a little rough. Um, so uh, be patient, we'll do our best to get back to messages, but the school is closed, we're all taking a break. And as a word of advice, um, Chef Kareen will back me up on this as well. When you get to take a break in this industry, take it. Because all of you right now are going through a lot of sacrifice while you're attending school and building a better future. Uh, and a lot of times you get to miss out on family events or other things that you'd like to be a part of. Now's your chance. So dive in and enjoy it. Chef Kareen. Hello, What's up? hello everybody. Hello. Y'all have going? me so excited. This first week, I'm really excited at what I saw. But I do want to do a little bit of housekeeping first. So when you come to live session, be sure to wear your chef coat because you're still in class, okay? So you want to make sure you put that chef coat on. <clears throat> <laughs> All right. Now, I've seen some really great work. But outside of that, Chef, on time submission, you guys rock. Like, really rock. And I love that. Right, Chef? I, 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 I was proud of this class. <laughs> so keep this passion going. I'm going to ask you to crank it up a little bit more going into week two. But let's uh, take a look back at week one. I'm going to share my page with you. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so look at this. This is pretty much what I was seeing throughout the whole last couple of days. Nice wow. plate ups, playing with the colors. Um, so this is the chicken Florentine, and many of you are pointed out to you the roll, right? Which is the roulade. And the roulade, if you've ever had a Susie, uh, I say a Susie Q, but a, what is it? Yeah, I guess it's a Susie Q or a Swiss roll where it's, it's a pastry, but it has the white cream inside and it's just running all the way through the swirl. That's also a roulade, right? It's just a, the way it's rolled. And um, nicely breaded, but look at the plate ups. I'm a, I'm a stickler for plate ups and I love plates. That's like the next thing I actually want to get into to sell as a product. So um, very nice here. This person added uh, some artichokes, some pasta. They have the little roulade going on. But the other thing I want to point out with the chicken Florentine, you must pound that chicken out. Some of you said that the filling was falling out. It could be because you didn't pound the chicken out thin enough. You want to go go down to maybe about a half an inch thick and pound it out in circular motion so you can have like a nice even uh, consistency and thickness, all right? So just to give you some ideas on some plate ups, right? Now, I had a few people that use maybe different shapes or different colors. That's okay. I'm not, you know, grading you on the plate itself. I just need you to submit two plates and they need to be pretty much identical. 
okay? The way, if this one is like, if the artichokes is here, you normally have your, your protein about, what is it? Three, between three and six, right? And then you have your, um, your starch and then your veggies, right? So this, uh, if this is being placed right in front of the guest right here, this plate should be turned the same way. That's what we mean about identical. And all this person has to do is spin this one around and the guests will be right here and the plates will look the same. Why is that important? Because if Johnny is at one table and Susie is at another table or at the same table and they order the same thing and the proteins are much larger on Johnny's and smaller or any of the items, Susie is gonna call her waiter back and complain. Right, so you want that even consistency all the way through, like we talk about with knife cuts. And then here we have the jerk chicken. I'm gonna go into my vision voice for this one. All right, nice and colorful going on here, boy. My mother would be pleased with one up. So you have the peas and rice down here, and then um, a caramelized uh, pineapple, and then you have the the veggies right it's something we would always have on the plate too and then this one pretty much kind of did the same thing over here this one got a little bit hot and spicy oh gosh i went back to the brooklyn accent well let me go back into the Beijing accent so right here they have the chilies right charred but the thing is about this you don't want to necessarily add all of these chilies just in case someone picks it up and bites it and it's like extremely hot so just be careful with that. But I just wanted to show you the plate ups. The other thing I was looking for on the jerk was to see if you charred and burnt. Because remember last week I talked about if it's burnt, it's going to be very bitter. And you have to be careful with all the herbs sitting on top, whether it's in the oven or on the grill. All right. But outside of that, you guys are off to a great start. Crank it up, we're getting ready to do some French onion soup and that's where the knife cuts really come in. All right, Chef, I'm throwing it back to you. Cool, thank you, Chef Kareen, that was awesome. Uh, great job, everybody, in week one. It's really, it's, it's really rewarding for us as, as instructors to uh, take a look at those photos. And I, I, I think those chicken roulades look fantastic and so did the jerk chicken. Uh, I haven't had dinner yet and now I want dinner. So uh, great job, everybody, that's really cool to see. So, hey, this is a reminder, Monday, November the 25th, 6.45 p.m. Central Standard Time for our week three live session next week. No live session on Wednesday. School is going to be closed Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Very difficult to get a hold of us. All right, ladies and gents, let's take a look at this week. Hey, we're going to one of our most favorite countries, and that's France. And uh, a lot of uh, what we do in the world of culinary arts originated from there. They're the ones that kind of formalized and kind of put it all together. They're not the ones that invented it, but they're kind of the ones that kind of grouped it all together. So let's take a quick look at where we're going this week. Once again, excellent assignments in week one, and this class rocks. Uh, absolutely. Hey, uh, great job getting your assignments uh, in on time. Start shooting to uh, try to get them in a little bit earlier. It is a chef standard. Uh, and we're not just harping on you just for no reason. But once you get into industry, we love proaction before reaction. If we're going to be doing a big banquet for 500 people or 1,000 people, we don't start till it's due. We start as soon as we possibly can. Chef Kareen knows real well. We'll sit down and we'll make a prep list and we'll organize everything. And we'll say, we're going to do this on Tuesday. We're going to do this on Wednesday. And boom, it's a great habit to get yourselves into now because once you get into industry, that's what you're going to be doing. So get used to it now. Make your life easy. Hey, don't forget, Chef Kareen and I are here for your success. If you guys get stuck on your assignments and you guys need help in any way, shape, or form, please reach out, let us know, send us a quick message, give us a call. We are here at your service and we're looking to make this class number one at Escoffier and I know that we can do that. Uh, and some of the things that we look for are the on-time submissions and this class is off to a fantastic start. So great job, everybody. Ladies and gents, let's take a look at our week two class page. So this week, make sure that you pay close attention to these research materials. That's where the real solid information is and a lot of learning takes place in there. And it's also a way to check off attendance. Uh, very, very important. 
Your knowledge checks, you have two this week. Don't forget that you can take those knowledge checks as many times as you like and only the highest score is gonna remain. So sometimes when we reach out to you and you say, hey, you doing all right? Make sure you post a tennis today. You can take the knowledge check again and it won't affect your grade. Thank you very much for attendance at the live session. Those that attend the live session are always the ones that walk out of the class with 100%. So all, the only thing you're doing by being here is setting yourself up for success. And uh, Chef Karine and I love when we see that. And then, hey, this week, France, and one of our most favorite soups, French onion soup. It sounds kind of like a simple soup, but there's a lot of technique involved, and we're going to get into that here in just a few minutes. And then, ladies and gents, like we talked about, we love prep list. Very, very important uh, in the world of culinary arts. All successful chefs, from Thomas Keller all the way down to the prep cook, start their days with the prep list, because we have so much in our heads uh, that it is difficult to remember. So, hey, thanks for being here today on Wednesday. Read and understand those knowledge checks tomorrow. Just sit down and complete both knowledge checks. Take you just a couple of minutes. You'll be ahead of the game. And then on Friday, sit down and read and understand the assignment before you start it. And then uh, purchase your mise en place and create a timeline. We've noticed that a lot of people, even though the assignment is due on Tuesday, that does not mean do the assignment on Tuesday. You can do that before and uh, make your life easy. So we really recommend following this prep list. And then on Saturday and Sunday, prepare your assignment, check it against a rubric and submit it again on Saturday or submit it once on Saturday and Sunday. And then uh, sit back and wait for Chef Kareen uh, to get that awesome evaluation. And if you have to make any revisions as suggested by Chef Kareen, hey, you got Monday and Tuesday to do it. You are on easy street. So ladies and gents, the whole theme is work ahead of the curve. Any questions about week two in CU 132? All right, everybody, here is a quick knowledge conversions check, uh, conversions chart that'll help you out quite a bit. It's a little bit foggy. You might have to look up one on uh, the internet. I'll see if I can get that one replaced. So ladies and gents, moving in to France, uh, which is one of my most favorite countries. Uh, my culinary hero comes from there, and we'll get into him here in just a few moments. But taking a look at the country of France. Here we go, everybody. Up uh, to the northeast, you know, we run into the United Kingdom, England, and that great area up there. And then up over here to the, I'm sorry, to the northeast, up over here, we have Belgium, right? Belgian beer. You can't go wrong there. That, that's a winner. And then Germany. So you'll see a lot of German influence come into the uh, foods here from the east. And then also to the east, we have Switzerland, right? Switzerland, one of the most famous neutral countries. And I think they have fantastic cuisine as well. And then down here towards the Mediterranean, we get into Italy. And then down, we have the bootleg uh, down over here. Uh, and then this is the country. There are a lot of fantastic wine regions in uh, France from uh, Bordeaux, all the way up over in here to, um, to or down over in here to Lyon. These are some of the most incredible regions uh, that you can deal. And then of course, it butts up right against Spain. And uh, there's still a lot of argument with the wine industry because actually Spain is, is the world's largest wine producer. And, uh, but France claims to be the, uh, you know, the king of wine, so to speak. And uh, so those two countries kind of butt heads every now and then about the old wine. So that's France um, as it looks uh, on a map. Let's take a look at some of the great things that come out of France. First, the term restaurant uh, is actually a French term uh, that we're all focused on here. And that term actually means to restore. Uh, or it also translates into restorative. So if anybody ever asks you, hey, what does the word restaurant mean? Hey, it means to restore or a restorative. Uh, that's where people go to get themselves fixed up. Uh, they were noted as having this first restaurant in uh, 1765 that specialized in bone broth. Bone broth, by the way, is something that is coming back into the world of culinary arts with a full head of steam. Uh, offering loads of collagen and minerals and all that other kind of good stuff. So you're going to start seeing a lot more about bone broth here coming up real soon. 
This is an incredible chef here, a fellow by the name of Marie Antoine Karim, uh, who was a tremendous influence into the world of culinary arts. He used to cruise the streets of France and he would take note of all the architectural elements on the buildings. And then he would go back to his kitchens and he would try to recreate that same feeling with his food. And that was the birth of those elaborate French buffets as we know them today, the ice carvings and the tallow carvings. And Marie, Marie Antoine Karim was the first chef ever to formally document recipes. Uh, so he plays a major role in what we do today. And then yes, ladies and gents, my most favorite chef, Auguste Escoffier, uh, especially here at the Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. He was born in about 1850. Uh, he was the most prolific chef ever to walk the face of this earth. Much of what we do today, he is responsible for. For example, the Kitchen Brigade was done by Escoffier. We can thank him because we have an executive chef, sous chef, chef de partie, and all of these other positions. So uh, he's the one that threw that together. Before he did that, the kitchen was out of control. So they were all back there drinking and smoking, having a good time, and uh, we've all seen that. He's also the one that's responsible for the mother sauces, right? So we have bechamel, hollandaise, tomato, espanol, and volute. Uh, we can thank him for that. He was known as the king of chefs, the chef of kings. And he also hooked up with this guy by the name of Caesar Ritz. And they started the Ritz Carlton Hotel chain. So uh, unfortunately, he passed away in 1935. Uh, he had a birthday not too long ago. Uh, he would have been in his hundreds by now, but uh, he was absolutely um, <clears throat> the king of chefs. Uh, France also developed uh, hot cuisine. Uh, which is also known as formal cuisine, and that was primarily done for the uh, kings and the queens. And uh, many, of the re many of the techniques that we utilize in the kitchen today from our knife cuts, julienne, brunoise, souffles, all these other things stem from the country of France. So tremendous amount of culinary history there. Any questions, ladies and gents? Chef Karine, anything to add to that? Well, someone... Uh... I'm getting complaints. People, are, their family is not gonna like the soup. But just make a small batch, right? Here's a tip you can do. We are always talking about nothing goes to waste, right? So this is French onion soup. One, um, I think, I'm not sure, who was it that just asked in regards to, of all the things in France, why soup, right? Is that Melissa? Okay, <laughs> all right, this one's for you. Remember, it's technique. I'm looking for knife cuts, right? You have to cut the, the onions a specific way and a certain thinness, right? And this is all about caramelizing those onions. It may seem like it's easy, but the onions are going to test you. So you have to control your heat and those knife cuts are important. We want a nice, deep golden brown not too, too extremely dark. And I'll find some photos and I'll show you in a minute. But your hand is up, is that Melissa? Okay, um, let's see, what else? Someone asked, oh, their family may not like it. So do a small batch. I just need to really see your technique that you can handle these onions. Because onions you're going to work with throughout every aspect of your journey. Look, it starts with the mise en place, right? And then the mirepoix. It's 50% onions. So um, technique, technique, technique is what, what we're looking for this week. And um, in regards to your family not liking it, do a small batch, enough where I can see that you're producing the techniques and you're able to manage it. But here's a tip for you. I don't really like onions either. I don't like the texture, but I appreciate them because I know that flavor is in just about everything and it takes it to another level. So if I was making this soup and I had leftovers, you know what I would do? I would either freeze it or I would puree it, bring everything together and guess what? I will be making sauces at some point, right? Especially a brown sauce. So now I can use it. You can either um, freeze them into little ice cubes. Don't ever waste anything. I'll guarantee you of one thing, your family may not like bad French onion soup, 
But this French onion soup is good, and I guarantee you they're going to like it. So it's a lot better. Melissa, what's going on? What are you thinking there? Oh, no, I'm not upset about having to make the French onion soup. I love it, and so does my family. But I've been making it for over 20 years since I, I was a cook in the Coast Guard. So when I pulled up the page, I was just, <laughs> oh, is there something different? That's my only thing about it. But I'm going to enjoy making it yet again. Oh, cool. That's the cool. only thing. <laughs> well, maybe you can help us out then if, if, it, uh, if the recipe doesn't come out too well. So. Okay. But it, it, is, it, it is a soup that does require a lot of techniques, like Chef Kareem was saying. Uh, and that's primarily what we're focused on teaching here at Escoffier is techniques. Uh, because you always have to remember, regardless of where you go, a technique creates a recipe. A recipe does not create a technique. And once you learn the techniques of the knife cuts, the saute, the caramelization, and the creation of the flavors, then you know what? The world is your oyster and you can go in any direction that you like. Always remember as well, this is your culinary journey. And I guarantee you, your family's going to like it and they're going to support you on it too. Uh, because this soup is very, very delicious. So, all right, ladies and gents, back on track. Uh, let's take a look at some of the influences into French cuisine. Just like the remainder of the world, the geograph geogra geography has a tremendous influence uh, into the flavors uh, that we uh, work with. Last week, we were talking about barbecue up into the Carolinas and the North Carolina. We also talked about the geographic location to the Caribbean and how that started there and those flavors worked its way up our coast. And that's, what's, uh, that's what influenced us uh, to develop barbecue. And the same thing has happened in France. Up in the North, they have a lot of Celtic influence and a tremendous amount of uh, seafood access up there in those cold waters. So you'll see a lot of uh, seafood, Dover sole, prawns, that type of thing are really popular up in that region. And then the German uh, influence has been tremendous uh, into French cuisine. Everything from pickled items to breaded items. And you'll also notice as well with the geography of Germany, with the amount of cattle and pork that they use, uh, because that's what favors that climate, uh, those foods have really migrated into France, especially cabbages and potatoes and things of that nature. So Germany has pay, played a big influence in that. And then the southwest of France borders with Spain, uh, and there is a lot of influences from the Spanish cuisine, um, which we're going to get into here in the next couple of weeks into that region of uh, Spain as well. And then Spain, you know, has a, a couple of regions that are known. Uh, this week we're talking about French onion soup right now. And traditionally when something comes from Lyon, it's called Lyonnaise, and it traditionally has onions in it. And so whenever you go out to a restaurant, you see the term Lyonnaise on a menu, potatoes, Lyonnaise. Uh, for example, that would be a soup or a potato dish that contains onions. So France uh, is really also dominated by its climate down in the south region. Uh, it's quite a bit warmer, a lot of fresh tomatoes, uh, herbs, and that type of thing we find into the foods. And once again, up into the north where it's very cold, uh, they have that nice white fish and the prawns, et cetera, et cetera. Let's talk about a couple of the more famous dishes from France. One of, this first dish is one of my most favorite ones, and it's called Cocavin. Uh, Chef Kareem, I see you smile when, when I say that. You like that, huh? That's a, wonder, that's a wonderful dish. It's one of my most favorite, uh, the chicken Cocavin. Uh, so it, it was popularized by Julia Child back in the 1960s. Uh, and she actually hooked up with Jacques Pepin, uh, who was a very famous French chef. Uh, and uh, when he got off the plane, she was one of the first ones to uh, be there to greet him when he came to the United States to work for Howard Johnson's, of all places. And uh, he and Julia and then eventually James Beard hooked up and uh, started creating uh, television shows. And um, this became one of her... Um, one of her signature dishes. And basically it's, it's a seared chicken uh, with the skin on it. And then it's braised with wine, mushrooms, uh, salty pork, 
mushrooms, uh, garlic, and uh, sometimes a little bit of brandy in there. But I, I just, I'd listen to that and I get hungry uh, just thinking about it. Yeah, it is super delicious. And then, ladies and gents, another really cool dish from France that I think is kind of underutilized here in the United States. But right now, this is the time of year to serve it. And that is cassoulet. Cassoulet is uh, an awesome dish. It's basically, uh, I like to call it a white bean stew. Uh, they have done it. I've seen it done with rabbit and goose and uh, mutton, uh, sausages, duck, that type of thing. Um, it is a peasant dish from the countryside. It is absolutely fantastic. We see the word mutton in there. That's traditionally a lamb that's more than three months old. Uh, kind of a larger lamb that they consider to be more chewy so or more uh, tough, I guess you kind of call it. So. Uh, that would be uh, the uh, cassoulet. And then of course we have the beef bourguignon, uh, which sounds uh, much fancier than it actually is. But traditionally it's uh, almost similar to cocovan. Uh, it's um, done with uh, beef. It's traditionally a, a diced beef. It can be a top round or a chuck. Some of the nicer places might use a little bit of a better cut, such as a strip. Uh, and it's seared and then braised in uh, red wine, uh, beef stock, and then it has garlic, pearl onions, which you don't see much anymore, but those are in there, and mushrooms. And then of course, in the world of sweets, we also have the uh, chocolate souffle, and souffle means basically to like blow up or blow out, and uh, the chocolate souffle kind of goes all the way back to the 18th century, but it's one of my most favorite desserts. Chef Corrine, you like the chocolate souffles? I like, I love, I'm not a big chocolate fan, but I'll have a chocolate souffle. You mentioned- yeah, they're, they're, There's something, I don't know, something about that, it's like a, a really romantic dessert. I, 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 whenever I think chocolate souffle, I always think Valentine's Day. And then um, the way you say a chocolate souffle. Yes. You know, yes. you have to throw that in there. With a little bit of creme anglaise on the Oh, side. darling, yeah. <laughs> and then you mentioned mushrooms. Oh, mushrooms and duck. Some yes, of those are my favorite things in the whole world. Yes, yes. Mushrooms can you and duck. Tell we like, love what we do. What's that? I said to them, "Can you tell we love what we do?" Oh yeah. <laughs> Mushrooms and duck. It's like Donnie and Marie Osmond. I don't know. It's 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 one of the it, it is it's like it, a brother and sister right there. And then our next dish is one of one of I think it's my ultimate food to eat. Um, if I ever had a, if I ever have a choice of a last meal, this is going to be it. It's confit de canard, and confit de canard is a very classic French dish. And uh, basically, what they do is they butcher the, uh, they butcher the duck, and uh, it's laid out with salt, thyme, bay leaf, uh, cracked black pepper, garlic, and then it's stacked into a pan. And then you you let it sit for about 24 hours to kind of create a semi cure on it. And then you will pour rendered duck fat over it, and then you will braise it uh, for a period of time, and it is absolutely delicious to die for. Absolutely wonderful. And then, ladies and gents, we also have the salad nissoir. Uh, the salad nissoir is a very classic um, French salad from the south of France, the province region, um, and it typically is a combination of lettuce, tomatoes. Uh, tuna, boiled eggs, uh, green beans, and potatoes. And it's a very classic salad. So, uh, and then ladies and gentlemen, this list goes on and on. Ratatouille, right? We all love ratatouille. The very thin sliced zucchinis, eggplant, and tomato. We've all seen the movie about a million times. And then the tart to tan, which is a French apple tart, uh, which is absolutely delicious. Ladies and gents, this slide presentation will be up on your class page, so uh, you will be able to, uh, to review this information whenever you need to get to it. Any questions so far? Does anybody else have a favorite French dish out there? Oh, they're all in the, in the chat, just making everybody hungry. Yeah, are there any good dishes popping up? Creme brulee. Creme brulee, 760 calories per serving. That's Serve easy. it with a defibrillator. Yeah. Lay with little bows to make this week assignment no money please. <laughs> Stop teasing us. I love what it. What else we have here? 
and, and Cleopatra sends me Morel mushrooms. Oh my oh, God. Oh, Morel mushrooms, yes. Oh my God. Yes. The climate, you know, the climate in uh, France with that cloudy, cool mm -hmm. weather is just uh, prime uh, for growing mushrooms and truffles, right? So white and black truffles. Uh, which grow underneath the ground and out in the forest. Mm -hmm. They uh, traditionally use pigs to pick up the scent so they know where to dig. Uh, however, they've recently switched over to using chihuahuas of all animals. And I'm dead serious about that because chihuahuas have a sense of smell that is equal to that of a pig. And uh, I recently was reading an article in the New York Times <clears throat> and they had a photo of a pig actually training a chihuahua uh, you know, how to look for these truffles. And it was probably one of the most awkward sights you've ever seen, you know, a 300 pound hog walking next to a six pound chihuahua. And uh, so it was pretty interesting. Um, at work, I just got a, um, I just got a uh, pound or half a kilo of uh, black truffles from Europe in, and it's, uh, we've been using those quite a bit. So it's a lot of fun to work with. All right, ladies and gents. Let's take a look at our week two assignment here in CU 132. Uh, I really think everyone will enjoy this recipe. This is a very classic soup. Uh, it's very, very important. Chef Kareem brought up a very, very important part. Uh, the cut of the onions is critical in this. If you don't cut them consistently, what's going to happen is you're gonna have small black caramelized pieces, and then you will have pieces that are uncooked. And uh, you don't want that. It has to be even all the way um, across. So it's very, very important. You, um, uh, when you cut your onions, adding sodium to onions in the form of salt is uh, always a good idea because what that does is that breaks down the vegetable fiber and it allows the moisture to excrete. And as you caramelize, that moisture is full of carbohydrates and those carbohydrates will caramelize and give you that nice, deep, color. It's very, very important. Ladies and gents, so your classic French onion soup this week. This uh, recipe yields about 32 ounces or a quart. Uh, it's, it's not a very significant amount, uh, so uh, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, make sure you do use butter for this recipe. We want to make sure we're not using margarine in the kitchen. Uh, margarine is mostly water, uh, and you'll have a completely different flavor profile. You want to use about two and a half uh, large yellow onions uh, for this. And what you're going to do is you're going to peel the yellow onion. And then from, from the bottom to the top, you're going to cut it in half. Okay? Not side to side, but from where the root grows down. There you go. Perfect. Yep. Cut it in half. Excellent. Thank you for the, the visual there, Chef Kareem. Uh, and then uh, you're going to lay the cut surface on your cutting board, and then you're going to come across and you're going to julienne it into consistent strips. Your cut wants to be about an eighth of an inch uh, is uh, pretty good. You want to, if you cut any thinner than that, you know, they might dissolve. Uh, so you could uh, go even a little bit bigger than an eighth of an inch, but you just want to make sure that they're all the same size. Also, after you cut your onion in half, if you look at the root end, there's the uh, core in there. Make sure you cut the core out. Otherwise, when you slice the onion, all of your julienne is gonna stay stuck together. So you're gonna wanna make sure that you did that. Beef stock, hopefully you have some in your refrigerator. Uh, if you don't, uh, you could probably buy some shelf stable beef stock. Uh, that is an aseptic pack packaging, aseptic packaging are those boxes that sit on the shelf that remove all the oxygen so it uh, keeps it nice and safe. You want to try to avoid the canned stuff at all possible. It traditionally has a very high sodium content in it. And then um, make sure that you have an unsalted stock because otherwise your soup is going to become very salty if you let it reduce. A little bit of brandy if at all possible. And then salt and pepper to taste. It is critical to taste the soup and adjust the flavors. Going back to the onions real quick, uh, we were talking, Chef Green was talking about making sure that it's nice and consistent. If your, your cuts are nice and consistent, if they're not and you get all those little dark pieces in there, then your soup is going to become bitter. Bitters on the back of the tongue that will invoke the gag reflexes. And so you want to make sure that you have an 
consistent cut. And then you'll need a, uh, some French bread, preferably a baguette, uh, very, very important. And then uh, you need about six ounces of Gruyere or Swiss cheese, uh, coarsely grated. Uh, that is going to be for sprinkling over the top and melting. So with the French baguette, you're gonna slice uh, probably about quarter inch to a half inch thick slice, and that will go over the top of your soup. So step one, after you cut your onions into that nice consistent julienne cut, you're gonna heat your uh, butter in a stock pot over medium low heat. Don't get it too hot. Remember that butter burns at a very low temperature. And then uh, you are gonna add your onions and cook until golden brown. At this stage, I like to add just a little bit of salt. Like I mentioned, it's going to break down the vegetable fibers, which will allow the carbohydrates to excrete and begin the caramelization process. Do not try to rush this part of the recipe. Uh, it takes time. Good French onion soup takes time to evenly caramelize. So don't crank your heat thinking that you're gonna get it done fast because the only thing you're gonna do is create burnt parts on there. So right here, do not brown too fast or use high heat. You're trying to convert the sugars in that recipe. Now once your, um, your onions are nice, soft, caramelized with that golden brown delicious color, right? Then you're going to add the brandy to deglaze. As a recommendation, uh, you know, a lot of us, a lot of times in industry when we go to deglaze a pan, we remove the pan from the heat, add the brandy, and then put the heat pan back onto the heat and then allow the alcohol to cook off. For those of you that are concerned about alcohol, alcohol cooks off at 176 degrees. So there is actually no alcohol content in the soup. Um, it says right here to reduce to au sec. Au sec is a French term that means almost dry. So there'll be very little liquid left in the pot. You're just trying to render the flavor of the brandy. And then you're going to add your stock and bring to a boil and reduce to a simmer. This is also another critical step. You cannot rush the preparation of the soup. Remember, step one, you have to allow those onions to cook over medium low heat. Let them take their time to caramelize, right? The better the caramelization on the onions, the better the flavor of soup that you're gonna have. So add your stock, bring it to a boil, reduce it to a simmer, allow it to simmer for at least 20 minutes. It's very, very important, right? And then taste your soup before you season it, please. Don't just put salt and pepper in there. That could uh, be a bad thing. So you're gonna take your spoon, take a little taste, and then adjust the flavors. Uh, right here it says you could add a little sherry if you want to, sherry wine. Uh, that'll sweeten it up just a little bit. Um, I kind of like the flavor of sherry in there, so that's kind of a nice thing. And then you're gonna keep that soup warm for service and for taking the pictures for Chef Kareem, very, very important. And then you're gonna cut the, the bread about three inch, you get it, it quarter inch is fine, uh, half inch is fine on that. And then uh, you're gonna need one or two slices per portion, right? So you're gonna have to get a soup cup if you don't have soup cups, there's a couple of other things that you can use. Uh, I've seen a lot of people do this in coffee cups and it works perfectly fine. If you don't have a coffee cup, then you could use a smaller soup bowl. I'm sure Chef Kareen will, will certainly understand uh, that will be fine. So you don't have to run out and buy soup cups for this exercise. We're willing to work with you, no problem there. Uh, and then uh, you're gonna put one or two slices. You're gonna add your soup uh, to your cup or bowl or coffee cup. Uh, you're gonna leave it uh, probably about half an inch below the rim. And then you're gonna put one or two slices of bread over the top. And then you will um, uh, toast. It. This recipe calls for toasting it, uh, toasting the bread slices in an oven or under a broiler. And I, you know, it, it, you can do that. Uh, some places are like all about it. And then some places just wanna put the bread uh, on the top. So. Uh, for this exercise, let's go ahead and toast them just to make sure they crisp up a little bit. This prevents them from absorbing as much liquid. After they're toasted a little bit, then you could put the actual uh, bread pieces on top of the soup cup that you filled up. And then you could cover it with a fair amount of uh, cheese. Uh, this, the, the, this recipe, I, I always struggle with a little bit. 
Um, so you're gonna about a half inch or a quarter inch below the lip of the soup. Then you're gonna put your toasted bread and then you're gonna cover it with a fairly liberal amount of cheese. And then it's gonna go into your oven underneath your broiler and melt that cheese until it's golden brown and delicious, right? And in French, that is called au gratin, uh, when you have that nice melted cheese on there. And then um, go ahead and serve that right away. You can do like a nice sprig of flat leaf parsley or a nice, uh, some chopped uh, fresh herbs over the top. But you really don't need to do too much more than that for garnish. Chef Kareen, do you have anything to add to that? Did we get it on the money? Sorry, I was trying to answer all the questions. Uh, yeah, you did good. <laughs> we'll find and out next week. I asked um, about using the bread. The tradition is to uh, toast your bread, your crouton, like Chef said, place it on top of your soup. You do want to toast it, right? Because if you don't, it's going to soak up your soup and become mushy. So another reason why it's there, it allows the cheese to float once you melt it. Now, if for some reason um, you can't use the bread, place that in your narrative and you would write this up like, uh, for instance, your server came back and told you your guest has a gluten issue or a religious issue. I want to see you give me a reason why you would omit something because this is things you would have to do out in the industry. Okay? So, but Chef, you know, I'm getting ready to run. I have to go to another class. And I will see you all on, well, on, on recordings. I want to see some great, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say on video, but some great soups. Don't panic. Someone uh, mentioned that they have coffee mugs, but they have chickens on it. It's okay. That's just the decor. That's fine. We'll, we'll pretend they're cows for this assignment. Yeah. I'm looking at what's inside. All right. <laughs> Okay, guys, have a good night, and I see you in your submissions. Don't forget your full self-ID with your footwear and your narratives. Insanity. All right? See you. All right, Chef Green. Next Take week. care. Thanks, Chef. Thank right. you. Bye-bye. All right, ladies and gents, does anyone have any questions? Any questions, thoughts, concern? All right, I know this recipe seems super simple and I know everybody's sitting in the, do not wait till Tuesday night to do this. Uh, this is a recipe that you can get done and uh, get it finished early. Make sure you allow those onions to caramelize for an extended period of time. 99% of the time people do it too quickly and the soup comes out bitter. So you're gonna wanna make sure uh, that, that could take upwards of 45 minutes to an hour to get those onions nice and caramelized. It is not a fast process. And then also make sure if you decide to deglaze with brandy, let that brandy go down to a sec. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Then you're going to add your stock, bring it to a boil, reduce to a simmer. You have to let it simmer for a little while. Make sure you use a good stock too. Uh, let it simmer for about 20 minutes. Uh, and then before you season it, make sure you taste it. Make sure it's balanced for the salt and the pepper. And then make sure you keep it warm. Toast your bread slices, get a baguette. Slice them, toast them, make sure you slice it at least three eighths of an inch or a quarter inch thick. You don't want real thin slices, otherwise they're gonna sink into your soup. Take your coffee cup, your soup bowl, or whatever the case is, you're gonna wanna fill it up so it's about a half inch below the rim. And then you're gonna put a couple of pieces of bread over the top and then coat it with cheese. And then into your broiler, that cheese should be nice and melty, kind of coming down the sides of your your cup or your bowl, uh, it's, it's almost like it's overflowing a little bit with cheese. And then don't forget the actual uh, garnish. You know, chopped parsley is a classic garnish. I like to use a nice uh, sprig of flat leaf parsley. I think it's a little bit more of a classy look and it looks absolutely fantastic. Any other questions, ladies and gents? You guys rock. This is a fast live session. This is incredible. Hey, ladies and gents, don't forget the live session is next Monday, November the 25th at 6.45 p.m. Central Standard Time. And don't forget that Chef Kareen and I are here for your success uh, to help you out. If we have no more questions, let's call it a night, everybody. I have one question. Sure, go ahead. Um, if you, 
I have a convection oven. That you have a what? Convection oven. Uh huh. To put the soup in to cook it once it's in the oh. oven, cook it. How high should the temperature be in order to, to get it to, to melt the cheese? Yes. Uh, you're going to use your broiler for that. So you're you, even though it's a convection oven, it should have a it should have a broiler. Uh, yeah, and that's what you'll use to melt the cheese. Okay. Yeah, that'll do it. Cool. Any other questions, Thank ladies you. and gents? Anyone else? All right, ladies and gents, have a fantastic night, and we look forward to seeing you Monday, November the 25th, 6.45 p.m. Central Standard Time. Take care, everybody.